This week on the show, the LPI has released the BSD certification. We talk about that. Uh, there's the open set of his trip report, and Alan will supply his own bits for that. Uh, we have an article about using FreeBSD with ports. LLDB got threading support ready. Uh, there's a little article, well, not so little, Linux versus open source Unix, and more in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 326, Certified Beast, recorded for the 27th of November 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Treuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Welcome to this week's episode of BSD Now, everyone. And we have interesting headlines for you in the, let's say, professional space, or if you want to extend your knowledge a little bit. Uh, we have the Linux Professional Institute has finally released the BSD Specialist Certification. So this is, uh, so going back a little bit, a uh, couple of, was it a month? No, it was a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, not many. Um, the BSD certification group who did the previous certification announced that they were um, kind of combining efforts uh, with the Linux Professional Institute who did um, a number of certifications, but they now joined forces and as one of the first results of that, that they now uh, released a new and updated BSD uh, specialist certification, it's called. And um, it's now running under the LPI umbrella, but it's all BSD and you can get yourself certified uh, at an LPI um, run event or in, as a, in a certification center, for example, and get your BSD knowledge certified that you are knowledge enough in the BSDs. So uh, from the uh, press release here on uh, October 30, it's been a while, but yeah, we only got to it now. Uh, Linux Professional Institute releases BSD specialist certification. Linux Professional Institute introduces a certification covering professional working skills in administering BSD installations. So mind you, this is not only FreeBSD or not only OpenBSD or not only NetBSD, it's all three of them. Uh, Linux Professional Institute extends its open technology certification track with the BSD Specialist certification. Starting October 30th, 2019, BSD Specialist exams will be globally available. The certification was developed in collaboration with the BSD Certification Group, which merged with Linux Professional Institute in 2018. That's uh, back then. Uh, so G. Matthew Rice, the executive director of Linux Professional Institute, says that, quote, the release of the BSD Specialist certification marks a major milestone for uh, Linux Professional Institute. With this new credential, we are reaffirming our belief in the value of and support for all open source technologies. As much as possible, future credentials and educational programs will include coverage of BSD. Unquote. Uh, the next quote here is, the BSD specialist certificate requires uh, passing a single exam. This exam tests skills in administering FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD systems. Covering the three major BSD systems ensures that the certification holder is comfortable working in BSD-based environments of any kind, says Fabian Thorns, Director of Product Development. Uh, so Drew Levine, who was chair, or still is, uh, of the BSD certification group, adds, we're excited that the partnership with the Linux Professional Institute highlights the demand for BSD administration skills to a larger audience. The BSD specialist exam follows the same rigorous standards as the former BSD associate exam, ensuring that the certification demonstrates competency in the core skills employers demand in a BSD environment. So, more from the press release. Uh, there is no prerequisite certification for taking the BSD Specialist Engineer exam. However, the candidate should have more than a year of experience in administering BSD systems of various kind. The uh, typical BSD Specialist certification holder is a system administrator of BSD operating systems and has an understanding of the architecture of the BSD operating systems. This includes the ability to manage various aspects of a BSD installation, including the management of user accounts and groups, processes, file systems, installed software, and client networking configuration. The candidate is experienced in using standard BSD and Unix tools on the command line. In keeping with LPI policy rated in software neutrality, skills required will be applicable across multiple variants of BSD. Uh, more information on BSD specialist exam and the learning objectives can be found at lpi.org slash our certifications slash BSD overview. 
For additional information regarding the LPI certificate program, please visit lpi.org itself or contact one of the uh, people, in this case, Fabian Thorns of the um, Director of Product Development. Uh, Linux Professional Institute is aware that economic circumstances vary greatly around the world and adjusts the prices of exams to candidates' country of residence. We use the United uh, Nations Human Development Index to determine appropriate pricing levels by country. The same will apply to the BSD specialist exam price, and exams will be available on Pearson View on the day of October 30. So it's out now. You can start uh, getting testified right away. And vouchers will be available on uh, lpimarketplace.com starting November 1st, 2019. And a little bit about the LPI itself. LPI is the global organization uh, for certification standards and career support for open source professionals. With more than 175,000 certification holders, it is the world's first and largest Linux and open source certification authority, and now BSD as well. Uh, LPI has certified professionals in more than 180 countries, delivering exams in multiple languages, and has hundreds of training partners. So this is the press release. This is the usual language they have. But it's, this is definitely good news for the BSDs because having completed this uh, certificate, and we hope many of you will do, this shows your employer, current, future, or maybe past, well, the past doesn't care anymore, um, that you are working with BSDs, know how they work, and that you can administer systems that are running BSD. So uh, definitely check out the uh, certification itself, what it's required, the learning objectives, and um, yeah, give it a shot. And it's definitely good uh, looking on your resume and you will be recognized as a uh, professional BSD sysadmin. And it looks like the cost is about $200 US uh, for the exam. Mm -hmm. Although in Germany, it's only $178.45. Okay, yeah. So they did that uh, calculation for uh, local country variants. And definitely it's uh, good to have this kind of skill sets even well, let's say you don't pass, but you still studied for the exam, you might discover, oh, these are the things that I don't know that are existing in these other BSDs. Or, hey, this is a tool that I didn't know too much about. So I studied for it. And maybe you didn't succeed for the first time. We hope you do. Uh, but in case it doesn't work the first time, you still learn, get something out of the experience. And if you get your employer to pay for the exam, even better. <laughs> as I said, there are study guides as well so that you can... Uh make sure you actually know the stuff before you go into the exam and then you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so if you uh, completed one of the exams, maybe in the future, then give us a shout out. Maybe don't tell us the questions because we don't want to know and this is kind of a secret and you kind of have to sign a little NDA. Well, I assume it, it works like the previous way where they have a, a very large pool of questions and each exam selects a subset of those so that no two people would ever have the same questions anyway. Sure. And you sign an NDA that you will not disclose any questions, but you can show, uh, describe your experience a little bit, whether you found it difficult or too easy or whatever. So get a little bit of um, feedback about that. So looking forward to more people having that uh, in their resume and getting the BSDs a little bit more in the limelight this way. Okay, next up we have something that's interesting to me and probably many others as well, the OpenZFS trip report. Yep. Uh, so this is a trip report from the OpenZFS conference, uh, which I was also at. Uh, so um, this is a good reminder <laughs> that uh, while it's been two weeks and I've done a lot of things since, I should actually talk about what happened while we were there. So the seventh annual OpenZFS Developer Summit took place November 4th and 5th in San Francisco and brought together a healthy mix of familiar faces and new community participants. Uh, there were also several folks from IX Systems there. Uh, so this trip report is on the IX Systems blog. Uh, and they took part in the talks, the um, hackathon, and the socializing at this uh, amazing annual event. Uh, the messages of the event can be summed up as unification, refinement, and ecosystem tooling. Ooh. The big uh, announcement is that the ZFS on Linux project will change its name to OpenZFS. Or in particular, that the source code repository on GitHub will change its name. The OpenZFS project itself will still exist. It still has its website and its IRC channels and mailing lists and all that, and will continue to be focused on Linux. But the source code repository will be OpenZFS, and it will be for Linux and FreeBSD, uh, and possibly OS X and the Lumos and, anywhere, and Windows in the future, as uh, those projects manage to upstream their uh, implementation details. 
Okay. Uh, so the much discussed hope to unify the OpenZFS code base across the supported operating systems went from dialog to action items uh, with the bold declaration by OpenZFS co-founder Matt Ahrens that the ZFS on Linux repo will be renamed shortly to OpenZFS. Woo. So that should happen before the end of the year. Uh, and uh, that will be very good. Yeah, it's the new name for all of them. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, when we when the OpenZFS project was founded uh, five or seven, seven years ago, um, the idea was, hey, if we had this one common code base, it'd be so much better. Although the idea at that time was that the common code base would contain only the operating system agnostic ZFS code that could be compiled in user land for testing on any of the OSs. Uh, but that the OS-specific bits for each OS would still be maintained by each OS. Right. The problem with this is nobody was going to maintain the common one because it wasn't directly useful to anybody. And so it never really caught on. And then for a long time, it, we just used the Illumos fork uh, because it was the one that was there. But now that we've upstreamed the, uh, or in, are in the process of upstreaming the ZFS-specific bits into the ZFS on Linux repo, we now have a repo that runs on multiple operating systems uh, and is closely related to the OS X repo. And so with that, we will soon have three operating systems running out of one repo, and uh, it will be better for everyone. Yep. Uh, it especially benefits FreeBSD because it means that Every pull request that's about to be merged into OpenZFS must pass the ZFS test suite on both Linux and FreeBSD before it can be committed. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's good for everyone. So that bugs don't suddenly appear in the other operating system. And it will keep Linuxisms from creeping in and so on because that's uh, a concern for everyone. Also, they announced that uh, they will call it OpenZFS 2.0 to mark the point where we've got everybody in sync. Uh, and that they expect to have basically one major milestone release each year uh, with the new versions. And uh, trying to synchronize that to to hit the long-term support versions of various OSs that use it is going to be a bit of a challenge, but we're that's something we definitely are keeping in mind. Uh, so hopefully that means that, you know, uh, FreeBSD 13 will ship with OpenZFS 3.0 or something, whatever the newest is at the time. Uh, that's more catchy, yeah. <laughs> well, in particular, uh, it'll also, yes, it'll be easier to tell which features are where. Uh, you know, I kind of feel like we should just use the year instead of a version number, but, mm. you know, open ZFS 2020. Sure. But anyway. Yeah, okay, it's a name. That'll be good. Uh, there were a bunch of talks at the conference, including... One of my favorite talks was the Metaslab Allocation Performance talk by Paul Dagnelli uh, from Delphix, which described how his team had used Dtrace to identify performance issues that were impacting clients and how they basically changed one of the in-memory structures in ZFS from an AVL tree, which has uh, an overhead of something like 40-something bytes uh, for each node uh, to a B tree, which allowed it to have... Uh, four kilobytes of, of entries in a single node and reduce the overhead by quite a bit. And then there was also talk about uh, using an embedded slog and a number of other adjustments uh, to the Metaslab size parameters and so on to improve uh, performance when allocating space. Uh, there was also Brian Bellendorf's talk on ZFS trim, explaining how the new trim code works and how it differs from the older uh, FreeBSD and the Lumos versions of Trim uh, that were never deployed outside of the individual OSs they were developed on. Uh, and basically, if you're wondering what the advantages are and why FreeBSD is switching to this newer version of Trim, it explains all that. Uh, and then I gave my talk on VDEF properties, talking about how uh, we're making it so that you'll be able to tune your... Uh, system on a more per pool and per disk level rather than just these number of system-wide tunables. But also being able to have ZFS deal with things like, what is the serial number of that disk that just died? I can't ask the disk anymore, it's dead. Hmm. <laughs> but my RMA process will be so much easier if, if ZFS remembered what its serial number was. And oh look, it does. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, and things like that. And then there was a lot of work on ecosystem tooling, uh, including talks about how to name devices on Linux, because it turns out it's really complicated and that they're asynchronous. So if sometimes you have to wait a minute before the name is actually there, uh, and we have 
Not exactly, but some similar issues on FreeBSD. Uh, well, not that similar, but uh, in the same class where, you know, if you open the device with one geom name, then the other names disappear, uh, which is usually what you want and sometimes annoying. <laughs> Uh, they also talked about uh, replacing libshare on Linux uh, with a different approach that's actually very close to what FreeBSD does uh, for managing NFS shares. Um, and then also uh, and shock from the Lumos people about how they manage to track uh, the, the SaaS infrastructure of their um, disks to figure out, you know, which disk is in which chassis and so on. And a bunch of that, which is pretty interesting. And it's interesting because uh, almost each one of them, of those talks that was about integration details was, why can't this be as simple as it is on that other OS? <laughs> but that other OS was always a different OS for each question. Ah, so you go round and round. <laughs> yeah, so like, so Illumos having libshare made uh, managing NFS and Samba shares much easier. But, and then, yeah, the device naming, it's like, well, you know, FreeBSD does this quite well and has the searching and so on. All kinds of stuff. Um, and then lastly, the really interesting one uh, was from Seagate. They presented their new uh, multi-actuator hard drives. So this is hard drives where the uh, half the heads move separately than the other half, ideally giving you uh, about 170% of the throughput and random seek performance uh, because you can read from two different places on the hard drive at once. The very first implementation of these drives is a bit special, though. It's a single drive, only available in SAS, uh, dual-ported SAS, because it exposes itself as two different hard drives. So it's a 14-terabyte drive that actually appears as two separate 7-terabyte drives. Oh, okay, that can be confusing. And then, so, if you're making a ZFS VDEV out of these, you want the two different halves that are the same physical drive to not be in the same VDEV. Yeah, different VDEVs. So that if that disk fails, it doesn't take out two components of one VDEV. So you don't mirror the two halves, because that, well, that wouldn't get you any performance anyway. Um, so you would take, say, two of these drives and mirror the even and the odd halves of it separately. Sure. Yeah, yeah that, and ZFS needs to be aware about that. Yeah. Ideally. Because they also talked about in the future what the other options are. You know, the first... You know, the naive option would be, oh, you, every even sector is read with one head and odd sector is read with the other head. But then if you're trying to read a bunch of blocks in a row, you're going to have both heads going across that area at the same time. And you're not going to get the additional IOPS, which is like half the point of this work. Uh, so you need bigger chunks than that. But how big of a chunk and uh, how do you lay it out? And, you know, if you just did the first half of the space, you know, the first seven terabytes of the drive is read by one head and the second terabyte, seven terabytes is read by another head. If you have a typical file system where you fill the drive from the beginning until the drive's half full, the second head isn't going to do anything. Yes. So that's not going to give you more performance either. Uh -huh. Oh, different considerations. Based on what their first couple clients wanted, separate drives was fine. Uh, and they just basically are treating them as separate drives with the caveat that you have to be extra careful when setting up your RAID. Uh, but it's interesting to see what the different characteristics of these are going to be. In general, you don't quite get double, but you can definitely get on the order of 170 to 175% of the performance of a single disk. Because it honestly is almost actually two smaller hard drives that only take up the same space as one. But it's very interesting. Mm, definitely, yeah. And we'll hear more about these drives. Yes, and then after all the presentations, we did uh, hackathon projects where people just got to work on stuff. Uh, in particular, super helpful to be able to walk around and ask experts in various things questions about stuff. And I you know, spent a bunch of my time working on that, trying to help uh, somebody who's working on breaking up the man page into separate pages uh, for each subcommand. And I helped with that a little bit. Um, and I got somebody else to work on the project I wanted, which was... Uh, breaking up the force flag in the zpool command into separate ones for each different safety belt and so on, and a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, and then at the end of the day, sadly, I had to leave uh, right as this was about to start. Uh, they had prizes for the best projects. Uh, and I think the, the winner was uh, Don Brady worked on the Metaslab worst fit allocator. <laughs> uh, so this was uh, basically exercising a way of finding the worst possible way to break up your data and fit it on the disk. 
which basically would allow you to purposely make a fragmented pool, which is why the tool was created. Uh, to work on the performance of fragmented pools, they needed an allocator that would purposely fragment the crap out of your data for no reason. Yeah, this is not for just fun and, and, uh, and giggles. It's uh, yeah, it has a, it has a purpose. Yeah, yeah, uh, lots of interesting things there. I think I have the winners. Yes, second place was a tie between uh, the. SDB tree walker. Um, so another thing that Delphix presented was SDB, which is a debugging tool designed to provide some of the useful bits that MDB on Solaris had, uh, but be more generic. Uh, and I've already talked to a few people about how possible it might be to get something like SDB working on FreeBSD. But anyway, it's a really interesting debugging tool that does really nicely for ZFS. Uh, and so Sarah Hartsey worked on making a B-tree walker that would let you iterate through a B-tree easily uh, without having to do it all manually, which was interesting. Uh, and that tied for second place with Ross Williams' work on breaking up the man pages into separate man pages per subcommand. And then fourth place was an SDB mutex command uh, by Jordan Hendricks and uh, Sarah Fem Dimitriopoulos, who uh, worked on basically being able to analyze mutexes. And then fifth place was uh, work on L2 arc performance when stored on NVMe devices. Because, uh. uh, you know, some of that, the L2 arc code hasn't gotten much love in the last 10 years. And the SSDs it was built for, uh, well, SS, it was built for SSDs, but the SSDs that existed when it was created were a lot slower than what we have nowadays. Mm. You know, no, nobody thought that there was going to be four gigabyte per second SSDs. Uh, and so some work needs to be done there. Yeah. And it's uh, interesting to see that. And, you know, a lot of interesting stuff happens at these hackathons just because, you know, when you can be in the room and ask uh, the experts questions uh, with low latency, it can really give that, that first version of the project a, a head start. Oh, yes, very much. Yeah. But, you know, they'll all still need more work to be finished. but. You know, that's not the point. Progress is definitely visible. So yes, uh, it was great to see everybody uh, at the conference, and I'm already looking forward to next year. Uh, this is uh, always good to see progress, and even uh, for me, it, it sounds like there's much more cross pollination and uh, projects implementing ZFS, looking at each other's work, not just oh, I'm al alone in the universe. Yes, uh, it's it's still difficult to consume the entire fire hose of everything that's happening in ZFS. Sure. Uh, but we're doing much better. Um, the monthly leadership meeting has helped with that a lot because uh, it means once a month for an hour, we can just get a list of what's going on everywhere. Uh, speaking of that, one of the talks at the Open ZFS conference had to be canceled because the speaker wasn't able to make it. They were sick. Uh. But that talk was given in the leadership meeting last Thursday or last Tuesday. Uh, so that missing talk is part of uh, the leadership meeting, which is all, each of which are posted on YouTube. So if you're interested in what happens in OpenZFS, all the talks from the conference and all of the um, monthly leadership calls are posted to YouTube on the OpenZFS account. Uh, so you can check out that. And if you go to OpenZFS.org and click on the Developer Summit, we have the slides for all the talks as well. Excellent. Uh, that's especially the things for the cold winter months to come, uh, <laughs> in case you get bored. Uh, all right, yeah, so thanks for that trip report, and we look forward to more updates from OpenZFS coming down to an operating system on your disk, <laughs> or disks. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm definitely looking forward to some of the things that are coming down the development pipeline. Time for News Roundup this week. Uh, we have an article as a continuation from our previous article, Using FreeBSD with Ports, uh, Tool-Assisted Updating. So part one uh, is linked there as well, but we are focusing on part two this time. And uh, so they start off with referencing the previous post, of course. Uh, they explained why sometimes building your software from ports makes uh, sense on FreeBSD. Uh, they also introduced the reader to the old-fashioned way of using tools to make working with ports a bit more convenient. And now in this follow-up post, they're going to take a closer look at Portmaster and see how it especially makes updating from ports much, much easier. Uh, for people coming here without having read the previous article, uh, what they describe here is not what every FreeBSD admin to today should consider good practice anymore. 
Uh, it can still be useful in special cases, but my, their main intention is to discuss this for building up the foundation for what you actually should do today. Yeah, like in general, Portmaster, probably not the right answer anymore. But it's, yeah, it's not too well maintained these days, but uh, it's still available. It does certain things. Uh, so building a desktop they have here as an uh, example. Last time they stopped after installing the Xorg Minimal Metaport in the previous article. Uh, let's say they want oh, we want now a very minimal a simple desktop installed on this machine. They choose the most frugal Unix desktop EDE, the Equinox desktop environment, kind of looking like Windows 95. Ooh, of course, we always want to get that experience back, uh, but that's just me. Uh, because that's drawing in things that uh, they need for demonstrating a few interesting things here and not that much more. Unfortunately, in the port 3 that they're using, exactly that port is broken. The newer compiler in FreeBSD 11.2 is more picky than the older ones and not quite happy with EDE code. So uh, to go on with it, they have to fix it first. They've uploaded an additional patch from a later version of the port and also prepared a patch from the port's make file. And if you want to follow along, you can copy the three uh, lines they list in the article to get that um, on your system and then follow, uh, get that EDE system running on the little bit modern version. Uh, thanks to build time dependencies and default options in FreeBSD, it's still another 110 ports to build, but that's fine. Uh, well, okay, if you have the the time and the horsepower to actually build that, but okay. Uh, we could remove some unneeded options and cut it down quite a bit. Just to give you an idea, by configuring only one package, like Doxygen, to not pull in all the dependencies that it usually does, it would be just 55 ports. That's better than 110 ports. Okay, but let's say we're lazy. Uh, do we have to face all of those configure dialogs, 72 in total? Uh, in case you're curious? No, we don't. That's why Portmaster has the capital G flag, which skips the config make target and just uses the standard port options. So yeah, it's using the default, so you don't have to see all those uh, C dialog windows. So it's portmaster dash capital D capital G x11 dash WM slash EDE in this case. Using this option can be a huge time saver if you're building something where you know that you don't need to change the options for the application and its dependencies. Then they walk through uh, the process of when a system update happens, like in case 11.3 is out now, so or 12.1 if you're looking at this now. Um, now that we have a simple test system with 265 uh, installed but outdated packages, let's update it. So there's a new base operating system version, and that needs to uh, that is also reflecting into the port system eventually. Uh, FreeBSD keeps third-party software installed from packages or ports, unlike Linux, and the actual operating system separate. We will update the latter first, so they do FreeBSD update, upgrade-r11.3 release, and then the up updated downloads and updates the version of FreeBSD using FreeBSD update-installed, and another shutdown and another FreeBSD update install run. So now we have a new version after merging all these. So... Then, on this fresh 11.3 system, you should first get rid of the old ports tree to replace it with a newer one, right? Wait, hold that RM command for a second and let me, them show you something really useful. If you take a look at uh, user ports directory, you'll find a file appropriately named UPDATING, in all caps. And since that's right what we're about to do, why not take a look at it? So it's uh, basically a file that describes... Uh, instructions for certain ports that need uh, to be happening in order to get to the new version on new operating system base lines. So they check out a new ports tree, uh, delete uh, the old ports tree and do the SVN lights check out of the new ports tree for that release that you just upgraded to, in this case 11.3. And then they display basically what software is it that needs to be updated in that new ports tree. And then they walk through a couple more options, like how you compare versions uh, with the package tool. And they also introduce portmaster dash lowercase a capital G, which will show you its plan and ask for your confirmation for each of these ports that are in need of updates. So they couple of con or cover a couple of other uh, examples, and uh, we leave that to your uh, interesting uh or readership if you're uh, interested in looking for more Portmaster. But as Alan said, Portmaster has a couple of nits now here and there that don't work so well. So we basically refer you to either using package itself or uh, the ports, the systems that are provided by the port system itself. 
Then next our next story is LLDB threading support is now ready for mainline. This is over at the NetBSD blog. Yep. Uh, so Upstream describes LLDB as the next generation high performance debugger. It is built on top of the LLVM client toolchain and features great integration with that. Um, at the moment, it primarily supports debugging C, C++, and Objective C code, and there is interest in extending it to more languages. Back in February, I had started working on LLDB, so I being uh, Michael Gornry, um, as contracted by the NetBSD Foundation. As far as I've been working on re-enabling continuous integration, squashing bugs, improving NetBSD core file support, extending NetBSD's ptrace interface to cover more register types and fix Compat32 issues, and fixing watchpoint support. Then I started working on improving thread uh, support, which is taking longer than expected. You can read more about the that in the September 2019 report. So far, uh, the number of issues uncovered while uh, enabling proper threading support has stopped me from merging the work in progress patches. However, I've finally reached the point where I believe that the current work can be merged and the remaining problems can be solved afterwards. Uh, so some big news, LLVM uh, itself is switching to Git. Probably the most important event to note is that the LLVM project is switching from Subversion to Git and move the repositories to GitHub. Uh, while the original plan provided for maintaining the old repositories as read-only mirrors, as of today, this still hasn't been implemented. For this reason, we've been forced to quickly switch the build bot over to their Git mono repo. Uh, and so the build bot is operational now and seems to be handling Git correctly. However, it is connected to the staging server for the time being uh, and its URL changed. Uh, but this means that um, Every time there's a commit to LLVM, they'll automatically test it on NetBSD, and this will help LLVM not to break NetBSD by accident. Uh, then they have a monthly regression report looking at what's gone the wrong direction instead of working better is working worse. Uh, LLDB, LLDB has been given a new API for handling files, in particular for passing them to Python scripts. The changes of API have caused some bad file descriptor errors uh, in a number of places. And I've been able to determine that the error was produced by the flush method called invoking uh, invoked on a file descriptor, uh, referring to standard in. Uh, appropriately, I've changed the type conversion method not to flush read-only file descriptors. Okay. Uh, and then Lawrence Diana also found another issue with fflush uh, causing similar problems. Uh, they also added a, a newly added test revealed that the platform process list dash v command on NetBSD. Uh, missed listing the process name, uh, and that's been fixed by providing arg0 in the process info. Um, and another test failed due to uh, the NetBSD target not implementing the shell expand arguments API. And a bunch of other stuff. There's also been some new work on LLD, the linker. Uh, I've been asked to rebase my LLD patches for the new code. Uh, while doing it, I finally contributed the dash Z no GNU stack option uh, patch back to LLD. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Camille, another NetBSD developer, has been working on uh, finally resolving the long-standing impasse in the LLD design. He's working on a new NetBSD-specific front-end for LLD that would satisfy our system-wide linker requirements without modifying the standard driver used for other platforms. And they have some updates on NetBSD 9 beta. Our recent work, especially the work on threading support, has required a number of fixes to the NetBSD kernel. Those fixes were backported to NetBSD 9, but not to 8. The 8 kernel used by the build bot was therefore suboptimal for testing these new features. Furthermore, the 9.0 release coming soonish, it became necessary to update the build bot to 9. The build bot has now been upgraded to NetBSD 9 beta as of November 6. Initially, the upgrade had caused LLDB to start to crash on startup. I have not been able to pinpoint the exact issue. However, we established it happens with the dash O3 flag in the high optimization level, and that by switching to dash O2, uh, the problem has been mitigated for now. And then it goes on to what their plans are for um, LLDB threading work and also for fixing support for concurrent watch points. And then it goes on to future plans. And they said, the first immediate goal is to investigate and resolve test suite regressions related to NetBSD 9. The second goal is to get the threading patches merged and simultaneously work on resolving the remaining test failures and any hangs. 
Uh, when that's all done, I'd like to finally move on the remaining two do items, which are adding support to backtrace through uh, the signal trampoline and extend the support for libexec info and the unwind implementations, both LLVM and non-GNU, uh, and examine adding the CFI, control flow integrity, support to interfaces that need it to provide more stable backtraces, both in the kernel and in user land. They'd also like to add support for i386 and ARCH64 targets rather than just AMD64 and stabilize LLDB and address breaking tests in the test suite and merge LLDB with the base system under the LLVM style distribution. And all of this work is sponsored by the NetBSD Foundation. Uh, and so if you would like to support the work, then you can donate there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that we get updates like these. Uh funded or even uh, finished. Uh, next, we have a well, a bit longer article by adminbyaccident.com about Linux versus open source. Yeah, so interestingly, they have kind of a, a table of different uh, uh, operating systems and what they support. Mm -hmm. In various things like uh, file systems, and then they have um, in that category, like ZFS support, native ZFS support, boot environments. So they have, um, they compare Linux, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, TrustedBSD, NetBSD, and Illumos. TrustedBSD, do they mean something different than the one I'm thinking of? Because uh, all the TrustedBSD code was merged into FreeBSD like 10 years ago, wasn't it? And there hasn't been any new development? Yes. Uh, so that's a lot of overlap in the two columns for trusted BSD and free BSD. And this is not like a, a pitchfork, a rant inspiring, uh, flame war starting article. Although the author mentions that he's from the BSD camp, but he's not, he hasn't wrote this article to incite any long term challenge or uh, flame wars. It's just a, a friendly comparison and he recognizes pros and cons on both sides. It's just state of the, of of the art at this point to just see what if people have a decision matrix, for example. I'm very curious about the, the trusted BSD bit because the old trusted BSD wouldn't have ZFS, and this says it does. Yeah, that, that needs investigation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what's up there. Ah, and all the Mac stuff that trusted BSD has is part of FreeBSD. Yeah. So Mac should be listed beside Capsicum there. But otherwise, uh, it seems to make sense. Yeah. So they have also uh, compiler support, schedulers. Uh, service control frameworks, of course, uh, firewalls, container support, um, or what other operating systems have in like a rough equivalent, package availability, high availability, permissive licensing, yes or no, desktop environments, and then Ethernet over USB, if, why that is in there, I don't know. But um, there is more text to explain this um, this table or more the, the choices and some of the history about the various BSDs and how certain things came about in certain operating systems, some with um, company support, something else a little bit more driven by the community. There's also a section about ePoll versus KQ. And so it's definitely not just a single-sided view. So they view a broad uh, couple of features that these operating systems provide, and they try to be as neutral as possible. And they feature in the update section down there that they first would like to thank the tone the people uh, used to disagree with him that they have taken. So that's quite a very a good uh, discuss, discussion culture. And uh, he acknowledges that he's biased, as anyone is. Uh, he prefers the BSD camp over the Linux one, but uh, over the Windows and Illumos ones too. It doesn't make those other systems bad, worse, or they have negative impacts. He just prefers one over the others. Isn't that what we all do all the time? Uh, the article is not intended to be close to a certain truth. It leaves the end open. Uh, he just wanted to challenge some of the ideas there. So I think that is good um, reading material and making sure that you still keep an open mind that there are other Unixes out there and depends on your problem space, you might need a different one for that specific thing to solve. That's my take on this list. But it gives you a, a current state of like, if you ever wondered hmm, what kind of support is in or in that operating system, what kind of features are in, in that space. Okay. We are now in the Beastie Bits for this week. Uh, we have a couple of items collected here for you. So the first one is support for Realtek RTL 8125 2.5 gigabit Ethernet controller. 
is available now in OpenBSD. Ooh, good to have. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if you're not familiar, the 2.5 gigabit Ethernet controllers uh, are sometimes wired up as basically a dual port gigabit, uh, but also the newer standard that provides 2.5 gigabit works over the existing gigabit lines you already have in your house. Oh, uh, okay. So this would basically let you get two and a half times the bandwidth out of the cables that are, say, already buried in your walls or between buildings on your campus or whatever. So it, it depends a little bit whether uh, if the interface is actually plumbed out as two one gigabits or as actually a 2.5 gigabit port. Um, but um, these are quite interesting. And I'm, uh, you know, if I hadn't already bought a bunch of 10 gigabit stuff from my house, I'd be really interested in this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And that's basically the commit message, uh, including, of course, a man page, like every driver for OpenBSD has, or at least uh, each commit should have for a new uh, device or a new feature, and uh, the code itself for the actual uh, device, the driver. Very cool. So check these out on OpenBSD, and maybe they find their way into other BSDs as well. well I'm fairly sure they will. Uh, next up is computer files are going extinct. Ooh. Yeah, so this one's kind of interesting. Uh, so it starts off saying, I love files. I love renaming them, moving them, sorting them, changing how they're displayed in a folder, uh, backing them up, uploading them to the internet, restoring them, copying them, and hey, even defragmenting them. <laughs> uh, as a metaphor for a way of storing a piece of information, I think they're great. I like the file as a unit of work. I need to write an article, it goes in a file. I need to produce an image, it's a file. Uh, so an ode to files.doc. Files are skeuomorphic. Uh, that's a fancy word that means they're a digital concept that mirrors a physical item. A Word document, for example, is a piece of paper sitting on your desk or desktop. A JPEG is like a painting, and so on. They each have a little icon that looks like the physical thing they represent. A pile of paper, a picture frame, a middle of a folder. It's kind of charming, really. One thing I like about files is they're a consistent way of interacting with them. No matter what's inside, those things I mentioned above, copying, sorting, defragging, etc., all work the same way. Uh, it could be an image, part of a game, or a list of my favorite utensils. The defragmenter doesn't care. It doesn't judge based on the contents. I've had a love for files since I started creating them back in Windows 95, but I've noticed we are starting to move away from some files as a fundamental unit of work. He says, uh, as a teenager, I indulged in the digital equivalent of collecting and managing vinyl. I collected MP3 files. So many 128 kilobit MP3 files. If you were lucky enough to own a CD uh, rewriter, you could burn them onto a CD and pass them around between friends. CDs could hold 700 megabytes. That's nearly the equivalent of 500 floppy disks. I go through my collection and painstakingly add ID tags uh, to all of them. As time went on, people started to develop tools that would fetch the track listings and automatically get them from the cloud so I could check and validate the quality of your mp3s. Sometimes I'd even listen to the damn things, <laughs> though I suspect the time spent organizing and validating them vastly outweighed the time spent listening to them. <laughs> I definitely can say the same thing about some of my parts of my media collection. Uh, then about 10 years ago, everyone started to use this green Swedish company. Uh, with this app or from the website, you could just stream whatever you wanted whenever you want it. Well, I thought, that's all very well, but what's the quality like? Is it better than my 128 kilobit MP3 files? Uh, as it turned out, yes, it was. Along the way, 128 kilobits, which is uh, being told is indistinguishable from a massive .wav file that comes on the CDs, had become rubbish. Now MP3s came at 320 kilobits. On message wars, people preferred, uh, you know, or perform spectral analysis on the files to produce bright green and blue colored charts to prove that files sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> like the ears are capable. Uh, yeah. It was about the same time as those gold-plated SCART monster cables were a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we were all in that hype. It's like, oh, here's the MP3 and oh, look at the bitrate. and. <laughs> Uh, and then goes on, I used to have a Sony Ericsson phone with a catchy name, the K610i. It was red and I loved it. I could connect it to my computer and copy files to it. It didn't have a headphone port, so I had to use an adapter or special headphones that came with it. In many ways, it was ahead of its time. In battery time, for sure. My new phone 
uh, well, not new, but the, the phone I currently use, which is a, a Pixel 2 XL, doesn't have a headphone jack. Uh, and I have the dongle to be able to use headphones with it, but it doesn't allow you to charge the phone and listen at the same time, which is annoying. Uh, I use audiobooks to fall asleep. And so I have a special speaker that goes under my pillow so that it doesn't bother the people I'm sharing my bed with uh, or person. Anyway, so I've been using my old Nexus phone as an audiobook player because it had a headphone port. But recently, the uh, the battery has started to swell. Oh. <laughs> and I'm no longer comfortable having this beside my pillow. Yeah. That could be a fire, ha- fire hazard. Dispose of that shortly. Yeah. And so I needed a solution, which was a device with a headphone jack. And while shopping around and almost buying just some old Android phone that I could run the Audible client on, I instead bought the uh, the Amazon Fire tablet, the cheapest one, which is $50 US, and used that because it was cheaper than buying a cra- crappy smartphone to be able to do the same thing. Just for that listening. Yeah, but it has a headphone jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's small. It's kind of important that we kind of miss these things that we're now used, so used to. And some companies take them away because they think we are ready for the next generation of devices or connectivity. Yeah, it's like, well... <laughs> I'm not going to have a Bluetooth speaker under my pillow because uh, that would require more power and stuff. And it, just, ah. uh, it doesn't solve the right problem. Yeah, uh-huh. But this is, I just want my file browser back. This is the point about the phones. Although admittedly, I still am able to plug my Android phones in, expose their storage as a device on my computer and copy the files to them. But still. Uh, but then he talks about caching and dependencies. And he's, I started building websites in the days when one pixel by one pixel transparent GIFs were a thing and a proper way to make a two column layout <laughs> was to use a table. As time went on, best practices changed and I happily repeated the mantra that tables should only be used for tabular data and not for layout as gradually you know, struggled to convert my trivial layouts into CSS and so on. But uh, now when I build websites, I run npm install and down, download 65,000 dependencies that get dropped into a node modules folder. So many files. I don't care about them, though. I just delete the folder and run npm install again when I need to. They're nothing to me. <laughs> it's like, how have we changed the meaning of files? Uh, and then also everything is a link. Uh, no files were harmed in the making of this article. <laughs> I went to Medium and started typing. In the background, my words were sent to a database. The unit of creation has moved from a file to a database entry. In some ways, this doesn't make a huge difference. The data is the same, just stored in a database rather than an HTML document. The URL could even be the same, just behind the scenes, it fetches the content from the database uh, rather than from the file. But the implications are much bigger. The content is dependent on a whole heap of infrastructure rather than being able to stand on its own. Uh, This almost seems to reduce the value of my individual creative act. Rather than warranting their own file, they're just another line in a database. Uh, my article, rather than being in its own file, standing on its own, is now just a tiny cog in a machine. Sure, but the database itself is built on files, if you really go down. Yeah, it goes on and on. But it says, uh, I miss files. I still create many of my own, but increasingly, this seems to be an anachronism, like using a quill rather than a pen. I miss the universality of files, the fact that they can work together and be moved around easily. The file has been replaced with the platform, the service, the ecosystem. This is not to say that I'm proposing we lead an uprising against services. We can't halt progress by clogging the internet pipes. I say this to to mourn the loss of the innocence we had before capitalism inevitably invaded the internet. When we create now, uh, our creations are part of an enormous system. Our contributions, a tiny speck in an elastic database cluster. Rather than buying and collecting music, videos, and other cultural artifacts, we are exposed to the power, uh, yes, the power hose. All culture raging us over for twelve ninety nine a month or fifteen ninety nine if you want it in HD. Uh, as long as we keep up our payments like good economic entities, when we stop paying, we're left with nothing, no files. The service is revoked. Obviously, files are still around. It's just we're increasingly abstracting away from them. I keep my own assemblage of files my own little world in the way I'm an anachronism that somehow bubbled up from the bottom of the thing most recently edited file. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's increasingly, not just in files, but layers upon layers to make it easy to not show the nitty gritty, dirty details 
to certain you or to all users how the things are put together and how they are internally working. I think the the point that I really took away from that was more and more we end up with this giant chain of dependencies to be able to actually use the file or or the bit of data. Whereas, you know, before there was an HTML page that could stand on its own, or maybe it relied on other files in the same directory. The graphics were not embedded in the HTML file, but they were in a directory with it. Whereas now, you know, it's like, oh, you need this specific version of this framework. And it's like, are you going to be able to get all these things required to make this work 10 years from now? Yes, yeah. Even if you can, will they run on your computer then? And how much work is it going to be to actually be able to make this web page show up? Whereas HTML files still render today. You know, if you pull up an HTML file from 1990, it's still going to render in your browser. It's not going to be very pretty, but that's it looks mostly the same as it did in uh, 1990, other than the fact that your screen is huge. So preserving that information uh, is important, or we lose certain information because we just don't have the means of accessing that anymore. And that's one concern that could be coming more apparent when we need it in like 10 years or 20 or whenever. And then we're like, oh, we should have considered that rather than switching from framework to framework to framework so quickly, especially in the web. Well, um, you know, the other one that came up was, you know, how many people invested their source code into Google code, which then eventually went away. There was a long period with like, here, click this button and convert it to GitHub. But if the original author was gone by then, you could end up with, uh, this code that's just not available anywhere anymore because it never got moved from the platform that went away. Whether that platform was, you know, SourceForge or, or Google Code or one of the other ones that's gone since then. Although we can still keep our own copy, the question is, can we still access that in years from now? Yeah, yeah and when we, when we make there be all this associated infrastructure with turning that file into the usable thing, how do we maintain that so that we'll be able to do that later. Yeah, so that's a problem that we all have to deal with and maybe someone has a solution or is developing something. But yeah, it's something we should be focusing our minds on occasionally and think about what are we doing here? Another item that we have in the Beastie Bits, leaving this important bit, although, um, FreeBSD kernel hacking. This is a YouTube video that is kind of an introductory thing, how to get started with that. And we also have another YouTube video about modern BSD computing for fun on a VAX, trying to use a VAX in today's world by Jeff Armstrong. So these are interesting to watch in case you are uh, interesting how systems work in behind the scenes rather than having some abstraction layer that we like we previously covered in that article. And the last item in here is, in the Beastie Bits, the Midnight BSD 1.2 release. So they write uh, in their announcement, uh, Midnight BSD 1.2 release is now available. It's a security and bug fix release, so most of the focus was on M ports and base system third-party libraries. So you can update that if you're running Midnight BSD. Okay, let's jump right into the feedback and questions section. Not before mentioning that you should definitely, if you have questions about BSD, whether they are beginner questions or more uh, complicated ones or more advanced ones, send those to us. Otherwise, this section will be very, very empty and will be very, very sad uh, because it not only solves your problem, but other people might have the same problem and you don't know who's listening and might be super grateful that you finally... uh, let us answer that question. So be, feedback at bsdnow.tv is your email address for that. Also for show notes, comments, ideas, and questions like the ones we have now. Paolo is the first one with a question about ZFS snapshots. Paolo writes, Hello, Alan and Benedict. I just listened to episode 321 and really liked the suggestion on the interview to have an install option to enable ZFS snapshots. Just wanted to second that. Okay, we got that. Uh, even if it's just a standard profile without any customization at install time, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people are working on a new installer here and there, or at least they mentioned that. Yeah, but this this would just be uh, having the installer create the cron tab and run the tool. So none of the tools are in base, uh, but we could import one of them, uh, make something, or have it install the package. Uh, I think I'd lean towards importing... One, I think the one of the ones that Brian Drury wrote, I think that uses the properties in the data set, so it automatically inherits, uh, would be very easy for the installer to add the default properties, 
uh, and create the cron tab, and then the user can easily adjust uh, after that. Wasn't his written in pure shell? I think so, and so it makes it easy to import into the base system. Yeah, so that could um, let you rest easier without having to think about creating these snapshots all the time and rotating them. It just does it for you, and you're happy that they are there when you need them. Dave Fullert is, I think, almost finished uh, his set of patches to make FreeBSD update detect that you have ZFS boot environments working and automatically create a snapshot before FreeBSD update starts updating your system, so you can always undo it as well. Excellent. That's good to have as well. So we look forward to getting that imported. So thanks, David. And as we you know, continue that type of integration and add it to more things, you know, there's a plugin framework for package that can be taught to do the same thing. Create a boot environment before updating packages so that you know, if your package update accidentally breaks your Xorg environment on your laptop and you have to present tomorrow, you can just roll back. Oh, yes. yeah. So small things like that can be a huge time saver and or lifesaver sometimes uh, if your phone starts ringing where is the database um, whatever data you're missing and you just get the snapshot uh, so yeah that's definitely good to have and we look forward to getting those um, thanks Paolo also for your uh, encouraging words about the show and uh, we move to the next one uh, Philip about GCP so Philip writes, Dear Alan and Benedict, I just wanted to say great work on the show. I really enjoy listening and the audio quality has definitely improved as well. So yes, uh, that wasn't our doing. We just had the right people in the back um, do the magic here. Well, we had to change our process, but yes. Sure, yeah. Um, but the, the audio enhancement is done by someone else. Uh, yeah, and so I wanted to relay my recent adventure with FreeBSD 12.1 release on Google and, oh, and on Google Cloud Platform, GCP. Okay, so Philip decided to try FreeBSD, and as he uses the F1 micro instance to host his personal website, which is free but has a pitifully 0.6 gigabytes of RAM, well, this meant CentOS would continually itself out of halfway through a YUM upgrade due to running out of RAM. He got tired of cleaning up his uh, this up, and so he thought time for a change. So Philip. Uh, was able to deploy a FreeBSD instance through the Google Cloud CLI tool and have it up and running with SSHD and Nginx plus that's encrypt in less than an hour, which is uh, which makes him super happy with a newbie like him. Ah, well, that mostly uses Linux. The handbook in DigitalOcean stuff was very useful too. Also, the real plus is that the memory use is below 200 megabytes at idle with FreeBSD and perceptually is super snappy. Great. Uh, time to start reading my copy of the design and implementation of the FreeBSD operating system, I think. Oh, yes, do that. Uh, actually, in an email, I had uh, mentioned, you know, especially since they were mostly doing system and stuff, that absolute FreeBSD might be uh, more their speed. But actually, they, Philip replied that he's been reading a systems internals book for Linux. And so, yes, design and implementation is the right analogy for that. Oh yeah, good to have uh, that kind of feedback. And uh, it really helps people who are kind of considering, ah, should I switch or should I try it out in a little uh, virtual instance in the cloud somewhere? This is a good um, report and encouragement to those people. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, another listener with no name. Uh, you don't have to provide a name if you send us feedback, that's fine. Uh, asking about old episodes. Uh, that person wrote, uh, Hey guys, I have a question about the show's archives. On the bsdnow.tv website, it says, 86 episodes of BSD Now since the first episode, which aired on March 29th, 2018. Oh, wow, I feel old. No, uh, his question, why is that the beginning of the BSD Now epoch? Where are all the old episodes with Chris Moore? Uh, so I think it's mostly when we switched the website to the fireside thing or what was in the RSS feed when we switched the website and the old episodes just haven't been imported yet. It's been on my to-do list for a while, but I've been very busy. Um, I still have the markdown of the show notes of all the episodes and yes, uh, BSD now started in like spring or early summer of 2013. So the, yes, there's a lot more episodes, uh, almost 300 more actually. Um, and I do plan to get those up on the website at some point. Um, uh, one of the tricks will be making it not appear as new episodes and confuse people's podcaster into downloading all the old episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, 80 new episodes to watch. Ooh, wait. <laughs> yeah. No, we'd be adding 250 new episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that will overload everyone, yeah. But yes, uh, if you go to the jupiterbroadcasting.com website, they do have all 325 episodes uh, 
available there. Uh, it's just the bsdnow.tv site hasn't had the data imported into the new CMS thing. Uh, yeah, but uh, nice to hear that people are still looking for the old episodes and uh, occasionally listen to it. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up this episode. Uh, thanks for everyone who sent up feedback and questions. And yeah, you will listen to us definitely next time, probably next week. <laughs>